love this is my favorite here i am right pretending to be a reporter jennifer broke up on the romance beat interviewing world famous romance author sarah mclean that's how it feels to me romance reader and investigative journalist yes (laughs) that is me exactly hi everyone i'm sarah mclean for this week only i am a romance writer that's true and reader yeah there you go and it is knockout week (gasps) tommy go boom I have a question for you, though, before we begin. Oh, we're going to talk about how it's dedicated to me first, because that's what's well, most important. Well, I was going to say, do you feel like it's your release week, too, in a, a little bit? Are you feeling more invested in this book than any other book? I absolutely intend to carry it around all week and, like, go into Starbucks and be like, hello, do you see this book? This is dedicated to me. <laughs> do you see where it says Jen? Obviously, that's me. I'm Jen, obviously. <laughs> how many Jens are there? <laughs> I'm Ken enough. I'm Ken enough. <laughs> You're Jen Off. <gasps> See? You're Jen Off. You need that t-shirt. Yeah. The other reason it's good that this is the release week, everyone, not that it's about me, but Little Romance left for Amsterdam on Sunday. This, so this is going to be... Yeah, so I will this be is like... A, this is an emotional week. Yeah. Jen is full of feelings. It's fine. But I have been full of feelings. I didn't expect to be, and I've been a little full of feelings. Well, because he's going... I mean, it's not like you haven't had to fly on a plane to see him anyway. No, but I was like, he you're moving to Europe for four a months. plane right away, but now he's going like across an ocean. It's very he cool. He is going to have the greatest time. Listen to this. One of my brothers, my brother Mike, got him what I think is the coolest pass. So and if all of you were like, oh, well, I have a niece or nephew going abroad. What should I do? He, um, Mike got Little Romance, a Euro rail pass. That is the greatest present. Isn't it? Because it's mobility. Because here's the thing. Right? People in the United States don't understand how tiny yeah. Europe is. Yeah. And how easy it is to get around. Like, yeah. Eurorail is incredible. Yeah. And you can go. So if you're in, say, Amsterdam for a semester, you literally can spend every weekend mm-hmm. in another city, in another country. Yeah. Also because of the EU, which is right. remarkable. Yeah, no, it's so cool. And I think the other thing, and I I didn't really kind of realize this till he started talking about it, because so many like kids in college when they study abroad do it the first semester of junior year, he has friends that will be all over Europe. I know. Right? My babysitter, <laughs> who is listen. She oh yeah, that's right. The most darling person in the world. Yeah, little romance. Like- One time I needed a babysitter because my standard babysitter was like not able to babysit for me because she has like a life or something. <laughs> and uh and so I was panicking and little romance was like, call my friend who yeah. goes to NYU. And now she she's going to Madrid. She she's in Spain. Yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. What are, how long have you been taking Spanish? And she was like, I don't I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> she has no fear. Like, kids these days. I don't know what's going on here, but these kids are going to be fine. Sure. So, it's I yeah, not like I said. I so I'm excited to have an exciting knockout Tommy Go Boom week to like kind of keep me keep me up. Right? A knockout of a week, if you will. A knockout of a week. I also return to work, and it's Mr. Reed's romance's birthday. So we'll be busy. Big. Big. Huge. Big week. <laughs> and how are you feeling about release week? Well, I'll tell you. I'm feeling weird, and I'll tell you why. Okay. I actually think I might like this book. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but as you know, no, I mean, the truth is that I am one of those writers who I know people throw around like imposter syndrome. I don't know if that's what I have. I don't actually understand what imposter imposter syndrome is. I mm-hmm. need to like look it up on the internet. Um, but I don't read my books after I've written them. Mm. I have never read a book once it is printed. Yeah, just done. Uh, because that way lies madness. Sure. Um, Because I definitely want to rewrite them. In fact, yesterday I was looking for for a particular quote to like share. Yeah. And I looked at it and I was like, well, that's a poorly written sentence. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't think it is, but I was just like, right. You do it differently now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but don't take that as everybody should. Eric should take that out because I want everybody to think it's perfectly written. Um, But the. What's really interesting is most of the time, by the time I get to this point, I'm like, well, it's obviously garbage. Yeah. Like, anybody who likes it is just mistaken. 
I actually like this book. Though. Yeah, it's really great. Which is very, it's a very strange feeling. It makes me feel like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're just getting older and wiser, Sarah. That's all there is to it. I don't know if that's it, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the vibe uh, and try really hard to continue to not look at Goodreads, which could be why sure. I feel great about it. Okay. So one of the things – so I have a bunch of questions. Before we dive in, though, there's one other thing I thought we should say since this is the last episode of season five. Yes. Which is wild. Season six Can isn't going to start. It? We're going to take a two week hiatus. So season season uh, six starts like September fourteenth ish or whatever. September <laughs> whatever that day is. <laughs> but in between, with a great with a banger of an episode. Oh yeah, we're really excited about it. But in between, you and I will be together in <gasps> At last. New Haven, Connecticut. Balmy, beautiful, sunny New Haven. Yeah. At a romance conference. You'll be there Friday and Saturday. I'll only be there Saturday. But Yale University. Yeah. And it's free. You just register. So if you are in. Yeah. If you're near there. Yeah. Come, come see out. us. Yeah, Adriana and I are teaching a class. I think it's. That might be full. Yeah. On Friday. Um, Beverly Jenkins and Roxanne Gay are having a chat about romance. Uh, you can watch a movie. You can hear Jen and me. And uh, Julie Moody Freeman, the host of Black Romance Podcast, on a panel. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. Carol Bell is going to be there. She does a lot of reviewing. I've never met Carol. Have you met Carol? I am about to meet Carol. We were texting I'm about this morning. I, I want to meet. Well, wait. I want to. We're going to do with Carol. Carol is moderating our panel. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Oh, have fun. Yeah. So it's going to be great. You guys, we kind of horned in on this panel too. Like, I, Jen, Jen was like, "I'm gonna come," and I was like, "I'm gonna tell them you're coming," and ask them if they can put a chair up. So, you know, I, I have some feelings about the fact that you were invited and I wasn't, but it's fine. <laughs> fine. I don't think that's true. I really think that it was just Jen has a job. It's, and Sarah I, doesn't. I do have a job, everybody. So anyway, we have a job today, which is to talk about knockout. But that's coming up, and it's the the weekend after Labor Day. So hopefully we'll see you there. And um, so let's talk about Knockout. I have lots of fun questions. One of the things I wanted us to talk about before we got started, though, is this fantastic cover. (gasps) Isn't she gorgeous? She is. And one of the things I know is that you had something to do with the way this cover ended up looking. So can you talk to us a little bit about this process by which we got this beautiful cover? So I had very specific ideas about Imogen from the beginning. And I will say, usually I don't have ideas about characters. I'm just like, I don't know, she's a redhead. Right. Like, (laughs) but Imogen, if you've read the past two books, the, the, the first two books in the series, Imogen is a character in them because the series follows four, you know, very close friends who are also lady vigilantes in a gang. And she is like the explosives expert in this gang. Think of it as like Ocean's Eight, but make it historical. Yeah. Right. So um she's been in this book, these books for two books, and she's very electric. Like from the moment I put her on page, I was like, oh, she's gonna be one of them. Yeah. Like uh, writers will understand this and readers too. Like sometimes there are just characters who like they just the moment they start to talk, they just like take they suck up all the air. Um, which is difficult when you're writing a book that's not about them, <laughs> but really fun because you're like, oh, like they're real. Like yeah. this is a real character who like has – who has like, you know, multiple dimensions. Um, so I knew she was like – I knew she was plus sized. I knew she had dark curly hair. I knew that hair was short. I knew she had a very particular vibe that I refer to as like – Helena Bonham Carter vibes. Mm, like, nice. Okay. Just like a little chaotic all the time. <laughs> um, maybe a lot chaotic all the time. I knew, you know, I knew all these things. And so I was like, it is essential to me that the cover model be plus sized, that, you know, like these things yeah. happen. And then I was like, and I want the pose. I want the, the like cover to be very tight on her. Yeah. I want her to seem like she's like barely in like she's filling the frame. And I want the pose to be different than any pose that you've ever seen on historicals. Yeah. Um 
which is a challenge because like you know, sure. she still has to wear a, like a dress. Yeah, there are and, rules. Yeah, she right. still has to wear a dress. She still has to. I mean, although I've broken that rule too, to be honest. So, but uh, that's a different podcast for a different book. So, um, but she's so fine. And I'm just going to tell the story. Nobody's going to listen to this. So <laughs> they're going to listen, Sarah. That's no, I know. But like, you know, nobody who is involved. In this oh, yeah. No, they won't know. Gonna Shh, everybody. To Shh. It's yeah. Don't worry. Nobody tell. <laughs> so, um. So I got an email about, and I'm very lucky because I live in New York City, and most of the time the photographs are taken in right. New York City. Um, and so I kind of emailed my editor, and I was like, it's really important to me that we get this right. I know we're very much further out than we usually would be with, you mm-hmm. know, photographing a cover, but, like, I want to make sure we find the right, the right model. I want to make sure, you know. We found this model, Sarah Goldstein, who's also an actress – Who's also, um, you know, she's a comedian. She's you can find her weekly at Drunk Shakespeare in the city. Fun um, here. She's tremendous. Um, and I saw a picture of her, and I was like, her. It's mm-hmm. like this is her. She's a plus size model. She's gorgeous. She just was perfect in every way. And so I said, it's her, and she immediately agreed. That's awesome. To, do, so to cool. be on the cover, um, which is always sort of a question, like a lot of models. Maybe don't want to be, right. Are resistant to the idea of being on romance, which is a whole separate thing. Anyway, and then I got an email from the costumer that uh, HarperCollins uses for all of these books because there is a costumer. And she usually comes with like three or four dresses and like, you know, boots for the heroes and like a whole – puffy shirts. (laughs) You know. (laughs) You guys know what she comes with. And like for example – yeah, like wh- there was a whole like, you know, Hattie, w- there was some discussion like would Hattie be photographed with a rope? So she came with a rope. Would Devil be photographed with a cane? Yeah. She came with a walking stick. You know, so those kinds of things. I get an email that says she only has one dress in a size 16. She – and she sends it and it is hideous. I mean, it's hideous. Yeah. <laughs> like empirically hideous. Yeah. And – um. This is the dress. There is no other dress. And I was like, we have to get another dress. Yeah. And she's like, there is no other dress. This is the dress I have. Because plus size models, human, yeah. living, breathing People. humans with real bodies, plus size models are very rarely on covers. Right. Right? Like when we see covers like Olivia Dade's beautiful covers and others, they're illustrated. Yeah. And I was really ins- – like, that was not an option for me. I was not going to allow that. Like, yeah. I wanted a real human woman with body right. Right. on the cover of this book. So I bought the dress. Mm-hmm. I was like, listen, I'm going to go. And I bought – I ended up buying three dresses because it also it was really insist- – it, it was important to me that she – that Sarah feel – Right. Gorgeous. Right, right. Because Imogen feels gorgeous. Right. And we went to the photo shoot – and I, you know, we talked and she said, tell me the character. And I told her <laughs> and I was like, you know, she's an explosives expert in a in a girl gang that like f- is fucking with the patriarchy all the time. Yeah. And she was like, I got it. <laughs> and and it was did. like the first photograph. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing. And then there's a hot and then Thomas. Yes. Who you will recognize from other of my covers is fine. <laughs> returns again as Tommy, Thomas the Boxer on Instagram, um, and he knows the job. Yes, he does. Smolder. Do some push-ups, <laughs> lay down in that chaise, and let this woman climb on you. I mean, it seems nice. Seems nice. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a job, but it is pretty great. Yeah. Like, he knows. He's like I, he's like furniture. He knows that. Yeah, he, right. Like, you are, he's like, I am a prop. She is the... He's just Ken. It's fine. She... Yeah, she is Barbie. <laughs> He's just Ken. Exactly. Listen, and let's be clear, on all romance novel covers, that should be the vibe. Yeah, absolutely. So Agreed. special for B in her books. Yeah. Uh the back of the cover is is uh Imogen. Yeah, climbing just all over. Fully him. climbing all over that attractive man. <laughs> This week's episode of Faded Mace is sponsored by Nikki Sloan, author of The Good Girl. Um, it may be my release week, but it's actually uh, a gift to me that Nikki <laughs> Sloan's book is coming out this week as well. A gift to all of us, Sarah. this is what I'm going to be reading today, because I've already read that other book. <laughs> uh, are you ready for this, Jen? I think so. It's just a little quiz. 
What are you supposed to do when your best friend's little sister, a classic good girl, asks you to help her go bad? You say yes. <laughs> no, I thought that was the answer too, but no. Preston Lowe thinks you should absolutely say no, and he thinks you definitely shouldn't pretend to date her so you can piss off her parents. Ooh. And you definitely shouldn't agree to take her virginity and show her all <laughs> the experiences she's been missing out on. And you absolutely shouldn't be keeping it a secret from her brother, oh. who is your best friend and business partner. Now, we all know that Preston is entirely wrong and you should absolutely do all of those things. And when Nikki Sloan writes it, it's just chef's kiss. It's going to be delightful and it's going to oh. be delicious. I don't have this book yet. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do an ad and maybe we could read it before <laughs> we run the ad. But no. That's OK. We're just. Did I pre-order it? Of course you did. Absolutely. fucking Lulu. Um, me too. So everybody, you can <laughs> also uh, have the good girl drop on your Kindle the second it is available. Um, you can get it in print or in ebook wherever ebooks are sold. Um, thanks to Nikki Sloan for sponsoring this week's episode. You are all good girls, too. So one of the things that is really interesting about these two is you have really been setting them up explicitly and at length on page in a way that is unusual, uh, right? Yeah, I've never done that before. No, I mean, it's rare, right? Right. I mean, often. because often we might know who is getting a book next, but we don't know who their partner, like a partner is. But in this case, like from book one, we had these chapters that were, you know, de Detective Inspector Thomas Peck was having a bad day. <laughs> that would be when Imogen would arrive to make the jail, for example, or whatever. Right. Spoiler alert for Bombshell, but yes. yes. So... A big bummer, by the way, that she could not blow up Scotland Yard in this book because she had already done it once. She had already done it. Like, and you're like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I really should have held that for this one. So why did this, like, why did these two evolve differently? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, they meet in the place, right? Yeah, and right. Uh, in Bombshell. And the place is a space where men you know cis het men are definitely not allowed right uh and they meet for reasons for romance reasons in bombshell he is with the hero of bombshell and they have to like enter this space right and um like instantly i was like well he's a cop so the bells are definitely gonna fuck with him oh yeah and then i and then it was just like imogen you know i don't plot as you know right and like i just like Imogen is there. Mm -hmm. And when you have all these characters, you know, I think uh, <laughs> writing this series, I've thought a lot about Susan Elizabeth Phillips once telling me that you just like cannot have a, a scene with more than four characters on page. It's just too much. Yeah. Which is like basically I have to, bre I have to break that rule all the time with when I'm this writing series, this series because yeah. there are four of them. Right. And then if you add in a hero and now like two of them are matched up. So they're all, the, you know, right. it gets chaotic. Um. You know, Imogen was just there. And Cecily, in that book, Cecily and Caleb were so, um, like, in their own, like, constantly interacting. And there was this police officer who was gumming up the works mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, just by virtue of who he is and what he does. And so Imogen was the one who was like, all right, I'll fuck with this guy. Yeah. Let me and then I was like... And then, but he, instantly, she was also, like, kind of Jessica Trenty. She was like, yes, I want this man. Yeah, his size. And <laughs> all the other bells are like, <laughs> look at this asshole. <laughs> you know, he's going right. to get it. Right. Imogen is going to destroy him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's been the vibe. And then, of course, like, at the end of Bombshell, I needed somebody to blow up a jail. <laughs> Who better? So, like, obviously it's Imogen. Yes. And the jail, you know, obviously Tommy's there. And then it was so fun and it was so clear in Bombshell. Like, it's these two eventually. Right. And it's interesting because initially I was like, is Tommy going to be for Duchess? Mm. Um, Like, way – this was, like, way when I was still in, right. like, the, the thinking phase of the whole series. And then I was like, well, he's clearly not. He's obviously going to be for Imogen. And then in Heartbreaker, you know, I just – it was such an, a natural, like, Detective Inspector Thomas Peck was having a bad day. It <laughs> right. feels like the perfect beginning 
to any yes. story yes. that will ultimately end in romance. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So because of her. Right. And so at the end of Heartbreaker, there's like a whole chapter, right, where they are together, you know, essentially. And then, you know. He turns up, interestingly, at yeah. the end of Heartbreaker, he turns up to a space that has been yes. fucked, o- like tossed over by yes. the bells. Right. And he's like, something has gone down here. Justice has happened yeah. in this space. And I have no understanding of how. Right. Because Heartbreakers, I mean, like, their whole world is about secrets. Right. And keeping information from people in power. And Tommy, by virtue of who he is, has a massive amount of power. Um, And so in that – and then she turns up in Heartbreaker. And my my favorite moment between them before now was the moment in Heartbreaker where she's like, you haven't had breakfast. I brought you a bacon sandwich. (laughs) And he's like, who the fuck (laughs) – is this woman i was delighted by it all over again when how I do you know it. i yeah. haven't had breakfast she's like i know i know things. she's like because we know things you idiot yeah <laughs> i mean i guess my question is is like one of the things that i tell people when i'm when i'm editing is sort of like don't paint yourself in a corner yeah right i mean That's so a piece of advice <laughs> too late <laughs> so did you find that you were painted in a corner or did it feel like it was I with mean, the two of them yeah i mean obviously had i i mean i don't want to talk i don't want to talk about police no right spoilers now, everybody right no exactly. no oh, spoilers this, but the like thing yeah right listen you you all know you would listen to this podcast like in 2023 right listen and everybody keeps saying Oh, well, Scotland Yard, like, you get a pass. And fine. Like, it's historical. Vaseline on the lens. There's, like, a fantasy piece of it. But, like, I wasn't about to give myself a pass on this. Like, there was no way that police wasn't going to be the big piece of this. Right. And, I mean, as you know, Jen, my big worry was, how do I pull this off? Right. Well, in- uh, so I did paint myself into a corner in the sense that, like, I don't know, had I to do it all over again, maybe I wouldn't have made him a, cop. a detective inspector. But yeah. I actually, I'm okay with. Well, and it was funny because when- how it all netted out. So I just have like a list of things, and we're gonna just go where it takes mm. us. So this like actually leads into a, a thing I was thinking about. So. One of the things that's really common, of course, in your books, especially because, you know, the historical romance hero is often an aristocrat, right? Like, so yeah. these are people who know how to, like, leverage power. They are insiders. Yeah. And Tommy is an insider, but not because of his status, but because of his job, right? Because yeah. of his position on Scotland He is Yard. the head of the inspector of the, right. like, of the of the detective branch of Scotland Yard. Right. Which is like a history thing. Yeah. That was real. And we can talk about that in a minute if we want to. Right. But the thing that I was then thinking about is like, okay, so thematically, one of the things that I think in this series you're really playing around with is kind of like how people um, face corruption, right? Mm-hmm. So the Bells, as you said, it's secrets, it's subterfuge, it's like working behind the scenes. So – how I mean I think because the law is not on the side, right? So now you of have the, the victims law, of corruption, right? So when you have an insider who now realizes the extent of the corruption that they're swimming around in, mm. right? So thematically, like, how do you do that and not have it be? I mean, I, it's still a romance novel. It's still fun. It's still an adventure. You're not looking to like you know write a treatise on <laughs> the yeah. evils of corruption in the police department, but. Obviously, you need your hero to understand that. He can't leverage his power the same way once he's aware of where it comes from. Right. You know, I think um, I was really – I think Adriana was a big piece of this. And mm-hmm. I think she would probably be surprised to hear me say this because uh, we never explicitly had this conversation. But simultaneous to me writing this book, she was writing Island Princess. And Cora, the – the one of the heroines of Iron, Island Princess is like, you know, as as Adriana describes her, like Cheryl Sandberg, right? Like this kind of like second yeah. wave, like girl boss, mm-hmm. gaslight gatekeepy kind of heroine who or person. And her 
arc, the arc of her story is her learning, like, that feminism is not, like, forcing oneself into the only seat at the table but blowing up the table. Yeah. And I think that Tommy had to have that same growth, right? Like, Mm -hmm. he thought of himself as, like, a man of justice. Yes. um, But had to learn through Imogen, really, that, like, justice is not blind. Like, justice is for people in the West End. Like, in, you know, west of Covent Garden. Justice in the East End looks very different. And it certainly doesn't come in the form of a police officer. Right. Right. I mean, and that's one of the in parts. In fact, it's the reverse in the in this book. And yeah. I would say, this is not an original. This is not like, oh, I made this up. Like, right. Po- like, this has, look, communities that are not wealthy, that have, that lack privilege, that have, you know, great need, have always been right. messed with by people in power. Right. Right. Well, and there's a great pr- scene in it. It's not, I hope, not a spoiler, but basically. I don't think any of this is, I mean, like, none you of guys, this part's obviously, a spoiler. Like, yeah, this, right, this is all. This, but Imogen at one point sort of calls him on it and is like, oh, so you got promoted for doing something for these toffs rather than for doing your job. And he's made so uncomfortable by that, right? And so it's just really interesting because his journey, right, is right. about, like, recognizing yeah. The power structure of the place he's so comfortable in. Right. And he's all – there's sort of like a class – there's a, a massive class issue here, right? But the biggest – I think I think his, like, moment of clarity comes with her saying to him, like – he's like, how could you say I'm not for these people in the right. East End? I grew up – like, yeah. you grew up in Mayfair. I grew up here in right. Shoreditch in the East End. And she's like, yeah, but what have you done for me lately? Right. Right? Right. And she sort of has to say to him, like, he can't understand, like, why no one will talk to him Mm -hmm. about all these terrible things that are happening, these, like, explosions that are happening. Because they're both basically – the plot – the external plot of the book is, like, they're both chasing the identity of the people who are blowing up places in the East End. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, Tommy is, like – I grew up here. Why won't they talk to me? And yeah. she's like, because you're a cop. Because you're a peeler, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you're not I, Tommy. You're not Tommy Peck They anymore, don't know right? you like that. Yeah. You yeah. walked away from that even though he didn't. Like, in his right. head, he's like, but I didn't. I'm here. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's, like, a really interesting journey. And, like, the goal is not for that to be a sympathetic way of Oh, no, living. totally. Like, right. Tommy has to learn a lesson. Yeah. But I mean, I think, I think it's different because when you have like Claiborne in the previous book. Oh, yeah. Right? He's still a duke. He's just going to leverage his power differently, but it's not like it yeah, dissipates or goes like, away. What do you need? Right? Yeah. Let me pay for it. Or Because also, Tommy's not rich. Right. Right? Like, Tommy has a job. Yeah. Like, you know, um, Claiborne's like, let me buy it. Let right. me, let you me, know, negotiate let it. Me let me away. Right. fight for it, like, in Parliament. Yeah. He, Claiborne knows all the paths. Right. So that was interesting to me, too, like, these two heroes sort of in conjunction to each other. Mm-hmm. The other thing, and this, like, harkens back to our episode last week, is the grumpy sunshine, the exasperated man of Tommy Little. Peck is... <laughs> pristine vibe sarah (laughs) so how do you approach i mean this is like a classic trope and really like it was interesting on our discord some people are like it's often grumpy something else right it's really hard to actually get grumpy sunshine Mm -hmm. but like it really is kind of a very pure version of this so yeah it's order chaos though right like it's grumpy sunshine comes in a lot of flavors and uh, order chaos tends to be where exasperated man I think really shines, <laughs> right? Yes, uh, yes. So, no, Imogen is like her whole her whole thing is like she is tied. She it has never occurred to Imogen even for one moment that she should talk something through yeah. that she doesn't like. Yeah. Like Imogen's a woman of action, and she's delighted. She yeah. is. Having and a ball she's like, she goes. I don't care for what this is. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to like la-di-da my way in there and blow it up. And 
Because, and I think that's partially because, like, her whole thing is, like, the world is not made for me. Like, right. that world is not made for women like me on, like, so many levels that she's, like, so I just get to do whatever the fuck I want. And I'm a person of privilege. I have access. I have, sure. you know, not a ton of access because she's still – is a woman in she the had, world. But she has some place to go. She has she money. Has she has friends. She Right? So there's a way that... And I mean, there's a great scene where her brother is just like talking at her and she just like walks away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? she, he's like, you're... The, I mean, this is the tee up to the book, right? Yeah. He's like, you are... 24. Mess. Yeah. You are chaos. And it's time for you to get married. And she's like, <laughs> I can't... You can't marry me off if you can't find me, asshole. Yeah. And she's out. <laughs> you know, and that's... Yeah. What's interesting is I remember writing that moment and thinking, oh, wow, like, that's not a moment you see. No, it really is. Right, exactly. Like, where she's like, you think you have me over a barrel, right. but I can just walk out of here. You literally have no interest in my life. Right. And so you have no idea where I would go. Oh, yeah. And it's great. Like, he goes, of course, to Tommy knows immediately where she is. Yeah. Tommy gets tasked with finding her, and he's like, finding her. She's, literally at this address <laughs> like i in five minutes right i mean so that's a part he pays attention right exactly and he's very familiar with her so the whole thing is like this sort of hiding in plain sight thing right which is i, I think also been thematically something we've seen throughout the entire series and certainly you're teeing up for duchess's book i'll just say that um yeah we won't spoil that no piece, but no you learn a little something about duchess a little something. <clears throat> you also learn that apparently Duchess is the only person who can wear white head to toe in Victorian London and not end up with a single mark on her clothes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> this week's episode of Faded Mates is sponsored by the New Romance Cafe and their book, Austin Tea Party, a historical romance collection for charity. This is really cool, Sarah. So a a bunch of really awesome romance authors, people we follow on Twitter and we know about, um, have come together to create a um, romance anthology based on some of Jane Austen's most memorable characters, including, it says, some we'd like to forget. So, Oh, nice. Fun. Retellings. Exactly. Retellings. And in this anthology, and what I love about an anthology is, I mean, this thing is 500 pages, so you are going to get a ton of stories. And all of them are based on, like, all the things we love about historical romance, right? Like the gossip, what's going on in the town, all of the, the ball, the ball and ballrooms and dresses and um by purchasing and reading this anthology all proceeds from this anthology go to breast cancer um the breast cancer research foundation that is terrific it is terrific so have some fun and do some good Exactly. So it is available on Kindle Unlimited, or you can buy a copy for three bucks um, and support this amazing uh, new romance cafe collective as they support breast cancer research. For more information about the new romance cafe, you can visit thenewromancecafe.com or join their Facebook group at The New Romance Cafe. Thanks so much to the authors of The New Romance Cafe for supporting breast cancer research and for sponsoring this week's episode. When was the phrase blow up coined for explode? Because it's not used in the book. Explode is used almost like exclusively. Do you know what I don't know? Okay. I'll tell you what, blow up doesn't sound historical in my head. Right. Is that what it is? It's like they're exploding things all the time. And I was like, oh, I wonder if this is something she looked up or knows. But like, no, you know, at this point, like this far into my career, it's just a. I mean, it probably to be fair, it probably does exist. Although explosions are really interesting. Okay. We don't necessarily have to do this on the podcast. I don't know who would be interested in the science of this. You and I would, so our listeners but, would. It's fine. So, okay. China had figured out – we know China and Italy both had um, – Gunpowder. Fireworks. Gunpowder, oh, okay. fireworks. Gunpowder exists. Gunpowder has existed in in the world for, like, a millennia um, for, like – 
a long time. Yeah. China nailed that long before <laughs> anyone else. And then um and then like obviously it's useful. It's like weaponry exists sure. with gunpowder. But gunpowder is a sm- it's I forget what it's called, but it's like a stage one explosion. Okay. Like it's a contained. It can yeah. be contained. I mean, obviously like barrels of it are right. a problem, but like you can use it in small batches to do very controlled explosions. But like explosions that would raise a building. Yeah. Um were very like that shit, that's chemistry. Like yeah. that's nitroglycerin and like TNT and all that stuff is literally this is one of those things where sometimes you start writing a book <laughs> and then you do the research and you're like somewhere somebody is taking care of me because <laughs> it literally was happening simultaneously in the like decade that this book was written in. Nice. Because I called like two days before the book was due. <laughs> final final like I had finished everything yeah i was just like doing the like last little bits of copy editing and i realized that i had left a note that was like fill imogen's carpet bag here because imogen has this like big car talk bag. about that next that's on my list um and it's like filled with dangerous shit <laughs> and so and also <laughs> like stuff she can use to explode things and also the whole book is predicated on Buildings are like coming, like yeah. somebody is blowing up places where people who are in need congregate. Yes. So I realized, like, oh no. <laughs> what if this is impossible? What if, like, literally historically, yeah, you know, nitroglycerin, like big explosive chemicals are like a 20th century thing. They yeah. are, in fact, a 20th century thing. Nitroglycerin is not. And there are, like, a handful of, like, chemicals that if mixed together, they had just sort of discovered in the 1840s and 50s that, like, these things would right. f- create an explosion. And so Elena Armas, who wrote The Spanish Love Deception, is a chemist. <laughs> and you called her. And uh, she's a chemical engineer, I should say. And uh, she was amazing. She, like, from Spain was, like... I am here for you. And I was like, I need the following things. <laughs> she what was like, is I in got you. Imogen's bag. <laughs> exactly. And it was very cool. And and like it just a perfect example of like romance has everything. Yes. Like there is someone in romance. We are so smart and brilliant. And there are so many of us that like the network is vast. And you can find somebody who's a skilled something anywhere. I don't remember what the question was. Well, it was just but like, why, yeah, why did you – things explode up. but not blow up? And I was – I noticed and I was like, I wonder if that's – But yeah, yes, so I did want to that's a little piece also, of information. I also wanted to talk about Imogen's carpet bag and her brooch mm. because – I don't necessarily think of you as being a person who really like leans into talismans like this, like the Clapus way necessarily, yeah, right? No. But in this case, I'm a setting person, not a yeah, like not a thing person. Yeah. But yeah. Imogen's carpet bag and this, she has this brooch that Tommy's is constantly noticing, like really loom large in the text because, of course, you're like, what's in that fucking bag? <laughs> And then you're like, what the fuck is with that brooch? What's with that? Because I also don't write about jewelry ever. Yeah, it's. I mean, so again, I was like, mm-hmm. I'm like, it's very noticeable because I'm a fucking weirdo. But you know, mm. so how? I mean, you're also a Sarah McLean reader. Yeah. So, so like, this is new. This is new brooch mm-hmm. on every outfit. Enough that a man notices Whew. the same brooch. <laughs> the same brooch made of obsidian. Yes. So is again when you're writing in something new. How does that process mm-hmm. work? Is that something you had to remind yourself to do? Is it something you knew was going to happen for her in particular? Well, okay. So here's what I will say. Imogen's carpet bag arrives from the – is like from the, the first go. thing yeah. we know about her from Bombshell, yeah, from bombshell. right? She carries this very large bag. Yeah. And inside the bag in Bombshell are like jars of gunpowder she has made in her bathtubs. Like – so that we we know, right? Yes. Um what we what we don't like so what we don't know is like the extent of this bag. Yeah. And um you know like there's a lot of Mary Poppins energy in this bag. Like it is a bag of convenience. Yes. Um for those of you who watch who watch Succession, there is I like 
I had, of course, written this whole book by the time Succession ended, or it's the, fi- the final season of Succession came on. And um, in an early episode, Tom Wamsgans refers to, like, she- he sees somebody who, like, is not of that sort of billionaire set mm-hmm. at a party. And he says, she's holding a ludicrously capacious bag. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my god. So there's a re- so I actually edited the book to put the word capacious in because it was like the perfect description of like just Amazing. a bag that is big and who knows what's in it and sometimes it's heavy and like um so truthfully the bag was like easy. I don't know how to talk about the brooch without spoiling things but okay, fair enough. Yeah. No, exactly. Well, I think the other thing like you know Back to setting. The other thing that's interesting about this book is, of course, Heartbreaker is a road trip, right? Like, they are quickly out of London. And this book is now we're back. And the other thing that's interesting about, like, about it is we're also back in the ballrooms. So one of the ways that uh, the plot sort of evolves is Imogen and the Bells agree to essentially, like, uh, they need some things to happen, and the way that that has to happen is there have to be some ball- people in ballrooms. And this is not typically, like, a typical thing we see anymore in your books. No, right? I hate ballrooms. Right. So you're putting them back in. I'm very bored by ballrooms as a, as a historical writer, which is a rare right. thing. <laughs> so I – and I know that, right? So I'm kind of yeah. like – so. was it more interesting for you to have that ballroom operate? Like, to make the – I guess to invert the power structure, right? And essentially make whatever is happening there um, be designed by the Bells, right? Yeah. Even though the... Her, the Earl of Doring, right? Imogen's brother thinks that he's in charge. He thinks he's in power. I mean, at this point, like, if you haven't picked up on that, if you've read all these books and you haven't picked up that at this point, like, the story, the theme of these books is very much like convincing people in power that they have power when they actually do not have power when you like being smarter than all the people in power right which is fundamentally how revolutionaries have to work right like yeah if you want to revolution you (laughs) must be smarter than the people who are in power um because you won't ever have traditional power and so like ballrooms are a space that is that have always I have always been when I am interested in ballrooms I'm interested in them as spaces where women hold power um but in this case yeah like this is why and now if and it felt really important to set up that like to remind everyone that like these women don't just own they don't just like Adelaide isn't just comfortable in the east, like in the on the South Bank, and like Cecily is not, you know, because they all sort of come together in like weird ways. The only ones who we know are like truly titled at this point are Imogen and Duchess, and so like this question of who holds power is fascinating to me, and uh, and also setting Tommy down in that space, yes, and knowing that he's like, and I. There's actually a whole scene, you don't know this, Um, there's an entire scene that didn't make it into the book, it actually got cut, but uh, there's the, I wrote the whole scene where he meets with her brother and is, and that scene he is, he is brought through her home, there's like sort of an echo of it at the beginning of that chapter, Um, he's brought through her home and he is walked into a room and there is a tailor there and he is dressed, there's a whole scene where like he is being fitted, the reverse, the sort of inverse of a dressmaker scene, right? Where a woman is being fitted for a gown and he's deeply uncomfortable. And I actually pulled it out because, I mean, I can talk about this. I can, I pulled it out because it actually made him, for me, it, it stripped Tommy of a level of like his own power that I didn't love. Like I wrote it and I'm actually like, the scene is really interesting. I'll let you read it if you want, if you're interested, but like, he just suddenly he he felt like weak in a way like I didn't like it I didn't like seeing Tommy uncomfortable in this way but then you can see the sort of just quiet echo of it at the beginning of that chapter where he's like he feels like he's dressed a kid dressed in his his father's clothes right right right. well and it is interesting because I think that there's a way in which okay like back to that insider outsider which I think Mm. we've talked about 
also, if I remember correctly with Adelaide's book is it's a different thing when someone who is like an outsider to a space like enters it like knowing, right? As opposed to being made to feel that way, right? Yeah. There's a way in which you like can sort of say like, okay, here I am like doing my own thing or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. It I, felt cruel in a lot of ways to like yes. give you that access to Tommy's feelings. Yeah. 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 I don't like it when heroes are uncomfortable at the hands of anyone other than the heroine. Mm, yeah, right? That's interesting. Yeah. Because I'm like, we're supposed to love them. Like, yeah. we don't want them. Right. You know. Well, and I feel that way, I think, largely about romance main characters. Yeah. Right? I like when they're like comfortable in their world. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And also, I want my heroes. And my heroines, obviously, my heroines. But, like, I want my heroes to feel like they are bigger than us. Like, I want them to feel, like, large. Right. right. (laughs) Physically and emotionally. (laughs) This week's episode of Fade and Mates is sponsored by Jess Bryant's Unbreakable Bond. Everybody... We obviously love a Faded Mates story here at Faded Mates. And in this one, Zoe Kent is convinced that she knows the man for her. His name is Michael. He is a born shifter. And she's just a regular human. And But she has it figured out. Like, she knows that he is the perfect one for her. Um, unfortunately, along comes her real Faded Mate. And that would be Michael's brother, Rafe. Oh! <gasps> Whoa. Twist. <laughs> exactly. And you know. Also, you can tell by their names. Of course. Rafe <laughs> is obviously the hero of this book. <laughs> yeah. No one's faded made his name Michael. I'm kidding, everybody. Sure. Um, either way, the part that's also, you know, he left the pack a long time ago. He's physically and mentally scarred <gasps> from an attack that left Stop his parents it. and his twin dead. He gave up all his responsibilities as Alpha, but fate has brought him back to the pack and all. All of a sudden, Zoe is in his path. So, oh my God. Listen, after we ran this first ad, I immediately downloaded this book. So, obviously, you should do the same out there. If you want to read this book, which of course you do because you're here at Fated Mates too, you can get it in print, in ebook, in audiobook, or with a monthly subscription to Kindle Unlimited. Thanks so much to Jess Bryant for sponsoring this week's episode. I'm really interested in. Um, some of the characterization things you do in this book, right? So, and this is where it starts to feel like it's a test. No, and it's not <laughs> meant to be at all. And I think, I think one of the things I have been again, this is like me as an editor, I've been really thinking about is how often people like forget that like small things tell us just as much as big things, right? Yeah. So, and this is like uh, so, and I, I was trying to really think of an example that would not spoil anything. So it's actually about her brother. So her brother is, she thinks, is just, like, he's this terrible person. He doesn't pay any attention to her, and he only likes lamb. (laughs) Like, so, like, she hates eating with him because she's always like, oh, fuck, it's lamb again, right? She hates lamb. She hates lamb. And it's just really, like, really easy to sort of, like, see this, see him through her eyes. And I was rereading, and then there's this part where she's in his office when he's, like, laying down the law. And there's this like little detail that um, his desk is made out of a pirate ship because <laughs> back in the day, the Earls, you know, their family were essentially like pirates and they'd like turn the prow of a boat into this desk or whatever. And I was like, how the fuck did I miss this? Right. Do you know that I this is like the fourth desk made from a pirate ship that I've ever written? I've never noticed it before. Every once in a while, a reader says something to me, and I'm like, I, it's just like, I don't know. That's just like embedded in, I don't know. But, but I anyway, also found myself thinking, like, here's this sign that maybe she is not really reading her brother exactly correctly, right? So when – is that something that happens, like, kind of naturally? Is it something you layer back in? Oh, Sorry. Shit, Jen. Now you're going to make people want that book. No, now everybody's going to be like, when do I get Charles's book? <laughs> God damn it, Jen. <laughs> Just doing my job, everyone. I'm constantly saying, I'm like, what about Madame Ebert? Doesn't don't we deserve Madame Ebert's story? <laughs> oh my God. Um okay, so Charles originally so here's my thing. I don't plot. 
Um, so often characters are very messy in the first in the first yeah. round. And then in revisions, the end of this book, so I always know kind of where I'm aiming for. And right. so I knew like the la- I knew sort of like the main set piece ending and like where it would go. Um, but there was I got to that part and there was the there was a scene with her brother that wasn't really writing right. Mm-hmm. And um and I knew I'd gotten him totally wrong mm. because I had written him sort of as a villain. Yeah, not right. A, I mean, not like villain, but like a like a like aristocratic older a, brother who doesn't give a shit. He wasn't a great yeah, dude, right? And he, for the record, is like not a great dude. Yeah, but he's like not the worst dude, right? And he has his reasons for all the things that he has done because everybody is the hero of their own play. Um. And then, no, and then I was like, okay, I've written this wrong. Like, he's wrong. Like, this is not the way that he is. And then I had to go back and, like, really restructure. And um, I think Charles also has an arc. Yeah. I think that when I talk about writing with people and, like, we talk about character work, like, the I think – I like to think that one of the hallmarks of the McLeaniverse is – literally any character you could follow them yes. out the door i've said this before and into their own story and it would be interesting for you whatever's happening in that other room and charles wasn't interesting in the first draft because he was like f- a flat stanley of a right, character right but then i was you know so then it it becomes more uh, the pirate ship desk i mean god i people are gonna want that but now i'm like oh i gotta write that now Sorry. If you have a pirate ship desk. God, I would like a pirate ship desk. I don't suppose they turn into standing desks, though, so <laughs> sorry, everybody. Okay, so yeah, I just thought, well, and there's like other ways, like, you know, you've said. Well, it's funny that you said that yeah. lamb thing, because I thought you were going to go somewhere else with the lamb, which is at another point, she's offered lamb. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like, I again, I don't want to give it all away, but I, I just, know, just I like know. a fun little. But I was just trying to think, like, how to illuminate the care in which you approach kind of telling us who these people yeah. are, right? And it does – listen, I can't stress enough how garbage my first drafts are and how much all of this just comes in revision. Yeah. All of it. The lamb, the, <laughs> you know, the desk, the, you know, all the little bits. Yeah. Everything – anytime anybody finds a moment in a book of mine and is like, this is beautiful, it's because it, it went through yeah. revision. Yeah. One of the things that's also really interesting is you are famous for saying one of my favorite things, which is name is destiny, right? Uh-huh. So why is Imogen Imogen Loveless? Oh, why is she? Well, it's in the book. I want to say she was initially Lovelorn. Books, like when I first, first pitched yeah. the series, I think that was her name, Imogen Lovelorn. And uh, that felt powerless. Yeah. And so I changed it to Loveless. And um, suffice to say, she is no longer loveless. No. no. Yeah. Name is not destiny. Name is not destiny. Hmm. But I, I mean, like, I love names. Yeah. No, I, re- I, I mean, I really do. And I think, like, I I think they're so I, – I, lo- I think about romance names as anybody who listens to the podcast knows. I'm always like, that's a romance name. Yes. Um, and so I think, like, yeah. Name is Destiny. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, too, because, like, she calls him Tommy, and he's, like, trying to tell her he doesn't like it. But, you know, then he, at one point he thinks, like, only his mother ever called him that or – right? Like, so oh, there's – That's such a romance thing, though, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Like, completely. Oh, that's a name from, like, past that only ever – you know, the only other people who have ever loved me have called me that. Oh, yeah. Else. It, but somehow – Listen, that's such basic bullshit, and I love it. <laughs> I love it. I am not a, I'm not apologize. I'm not sorry. Oh, God, no. <laughs> me neither. Uh, this series is so, like, adventure-filled, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a way in which this is about not just, like, sort of fucking with the patriarchy. Of course, that's a big part of it. But not just escaping, like, the boundaries that are set for you. That's a part of it. But also just about how much fun these people have with each other. Mm-hmm. So is that a vibe that – um is easier or harder to write as the series goes on or and also as like the world becomes more troubled yeah i mean i like it i like blowing shit up (laughs) i really do like right um the challenge when i sit down and think about like writing contemporary is you can't really blow shit up right like it's 
it's different, yes. right? But historical is the realm of fantasy. And like, yeah. I cannot stress enough how much I love historical romance, like as a reader, as a writer. But the also it just feels like really rewarding in a lot of ways. It is not hard for me at all. Like I, in fact, if anything, I fear that it's that it's like too much. Mm. Well, that's what her fear is, right? Imogen right. fears that she's too much, right? Imogen is me. I am Imogen. <laughs> but like there's this, you know, there, I mean, there's also, look, I come, I'm a, every week I'm a romance, like I read right. romance and I write it, right? right. <sighs> there's a scene on the docks in this book mm-hmm. that like was a fucking delight to write because like you bring in old home, it's old home week. <laughs> yes. Everybody's around, like. Spoiler, Wit and Hattie run the docks. Of course they're there, sure, right? Like, right. devil gets summoned. We, unfortunately, he doesn't get there in Ugh. time. But, like, he's summoned. Like, My there's, fave. if, and, like, I hate to, I, I, I often think, like, oh, I shouldn't talk so much about the McLeanaverse because it makes people feel like they have to start from the beginning. But, like, you don't. You don't. You don't. But know. everyone's a friend. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and that particular scene, like, there's an explosive, there's a, like, threat. You know, I mm-hmm. think a lot about Heather Birch's, you know, relentless threats yes. as being, like, part of what makes a book propulsive. Mm-hmm. I yeah. want that. I want the book to be propulsive. Sometimes I fear I put too much gas in the engine, but um, I'd rather have too much gas in the engine than not enough. Right, right. And that's why when I talk about conflict, I'm always like, external conflict is – essential yes right well and i think that's the thing that like evolves over time for these two especially right yeah. like they have you know how do you work with someone who has the same goal but a completely opposite set of ideas about how to get there yeah right and yeah. are working under a different set of operating rules i mean so yep. right like there's a way in which this is like really and even though tommy at one point says to her like or says to himself you know he didn't want them to be cat and mouse he wants them to be cat and cat right that he sees her as an equal there's also a really deep-seated part of him like his journey is understanding that like he is protected and coddled by the law Mm. and enabled to see his way is the right way in a way that she cannot right she's taken the matrix pill yeah right like this book offers Tommy. It's like that Barbie moment, right? It's the you yes. wear the Birkenstock or the high heel. <laughs> right. And like Tommy has to choose the Birkenstock. Like yes. you have to. Yeah. And truthfully, I, I think a lot about Jane and Krentz when I write now. Like Jane when Jane and Krentz says like the the purpose of romance is to drive characters to be their best selves. Yeah. Right. Right? You must choose the Birkenstock. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I have a I have a last question. We're already almost an hour in, and I know everybody stick around because we have the first two chapters on audio at the end, which is quite a treat. Um, our fave, Mary Jane Wells. One of the things I'm always thinking about with romance in general is like what how what it's in conversation with in sort of pop culture and the larger world. And I often feel um honestly like it's unusual for me to come across something that I'm like, oh, this is exactly what romance is trying to do and yet i did at the perfect time so everybody you might have heard me say i went to see bruce springsteen with my husband a couple weeks ago and he played my favorite song thunder road i'm not saying sarah ever thought about thunder road or bruce springsteen in the writing of this book but i I was confirm i can can confirm confirm. right however i'm going to tell you that i was watching um i don't know if you guys remember there's a show called vh1 storytellers and I was, like, sort of watching after the concert. Sometimes I'm like, I want to hear more yeah. about this song. I've spent, like, a really important part of my life. So I turned on – I was, like, just searching YouTube. And it's Bruce Springsteen talking about Thunder Road. And he says – and I was, like, his explanation of, like, what that song is trying to do, Sarah, is the closest I've ever heard to someone talking about what I think romance does. So I'm going to tell you what he said. And then I'm going to ask yeah. you a question. So he starts playing the music to Thunder Road, and he said, The the beginning sounds like an invitation. Something, something is opening up to you. Something is opening up. 
And what I hoped it would be when I wrote the song was what I got out of, out of rock and roll music, which was a sense of a larger life, a greater experience, hopefully more and better sex, a uh, sense of fun, more fun, a um, sense of your personal exploration and your possibilities. It was, and it, the idea that it was all lying somewhere inside of you and it was you know, just there on the edge of town. And then he plays the song and he gets to the part where he's like, you know, like, this is it. And then he said, Suddenly you are away, you're out, you're in your car, uh, you're, you know, your hair is blowing, you're flying. You know, that was, I was trying to get that feeling so people would want to go chase it. (laughs) You're trying to make people feel something so they'll go, they'll go in their own lives and chase that thing. That does sound like romance, doesn't it? It it does. And it was the first. In its best form, yes. its highest form. Yes. And I thought, that is what romance is. Yes. So, A thousand percent. That fantasy is the same. So mm-hmm. when you, when your readers are reading about Tommy and Imogen, what is the feeling you want them to be chasing? <sighs> I mean, it feels like I always answer this the same way, but like, it's joy. It's that you deserve it. How about that? It's not just like that I want you to feel joy. It's that I want you to know in your soul that you deserve joy. That you, every person who has ever told you that joy is derivative or val or has less value than pain or that, you know, joy isn't isn't a goal, a higher goal, a reasonable higher goal. Fuck that. Like, it is, even in the worst case, even in, yeah, at a time when it feels like everything is bad or wrong or burning or flooding or whatever is happening in your world right now, joy is Still valuable. Still that worth is, it. It has value and you deserve it. Still possible. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you deserve it. And you deserve it in whatever way. Obviously, in romance, we talk about it as like love, right? right. As, you know, a romantic love. But you deserve it in whatever way you find it. Yeah. Right. And if you have people in your life who disdain it or diminish it in any way, cut them loose. Find your your people, your friends, your bells, your – tell your sibling to be better at being a sibling. <laughs> Stop like, eating lamb. You don't want to eat. Find who will be your partner. Yeah, don't eat the lamb. Find the people around you who love you and find joy with them. I don't know. That's the – writing this series is just – it's such a, like, intense experience for me because it feels like – so aspirational for me on like every level. Like I, I, I feel like I've always been aspirational about heroines, but I always write somebody who I want to like be a little more like but this series feels like I want more time, like with my friends who are smart and willing to grab what they want and not let go. And I want a partner who stands like, right next to me and supports me like and I want I want all these things I want I, I'm like a Cressley Cole heroine mm-hmm. I want it I want it you're hungry I'm a Valkyrie I want it yeah you should want it too everybody right that's what romance is here for be hungry for the good stuff yeah yeah as long as you're not taking from someone else any other things that you would like to tell us that I didn't ask you about uh, you didn't mention the saint <laughs> Sorry. I did you to... notice? I did. Sarah, love it. <laughs> go ahead. Tell us about the saint. Sarah. No, no, no. I don't have anything to say okay. other than that. <laughs> if you love the saint, listen. Yeah. With Val Kilmer. Yes. If you are a Gen, a, a gen Xer <laughs> who, whose buttons were installed by Val Kilmer and Elizabeth Shue, you're going to have a time. You'll have a little bit of a moment. 
Well, and I think one of the things we've talked about is maybe that we should do a like a watch, a little like a read along, watch along, but, you know, like with Moonstruck, but with the saint for all the people. Yeah. <laughs> no, listen, I mean, I have to be honest. I, I don't actually have very much more to yeah. say about this book. You have, you are, uh, what I have to say is you are very good at your job. Well, thank you, Sarah. Jennifer. Investigative Procom. reporter. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I just hope everybody loves this book as much as I do. I'm, I really love it. Yeah. I'm very happy with it, and I am very happy that Imogen finally got Tommy. <gasps> Me too. There is like a really funny scene. It's I'm not going to say what. Like I was rereading the things that sort of just delight me, and there's a scene where she's like. Um, in the uniform room at Scotland Yard. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of like, what are you doing there? And she's like, yeah, I'm going I'm to, you know, design a new uniform. You're going to really like what it does for your thighs. <laughs> and I was like, just like, it's they're really funny Thomas together. Thomas Peck, who has never thought about his thighs even one time. And all she does <laughs> is think about his thighs. And it's great. It's great. <laughs> Thick thighs save lives. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. Well, um, stick around, everybody, because then you can see um, the hear the first two chapters of of this delightful book narrated by the wonderful Mary Jane Wells. And boy, does she give him the greatest. I, I texted Jen when I first listened to this because I don't actually listen to my audiobooks, but I did listen to like a little piece of it. And uh, I cannot wait. She really gives him like the full Roy Kent treatment. Cannot wait. It's great. I really I I love the audiobooks because I read so fast and it's so good for me to kind of just like luxuriate in it. And I am like that's the thing that's gonna be dropping onto my devices on the twenty second mm-hmm. is me listening in audio. And since I have to start driving to work the next day, it'll give me there something you go. to do. Enjoy. I'm very the the Tommy the yeah. Tommy voice. She really she nails it. You are listening to this on when the day it drops Wednesday, August 23rd. You can listen to us tonight on Likewise. Um, this will be an event where we are just like sort of checking in. It's an app you just listen to and it'll be audio but no video. And I'll be talking to Sarah about uh, this book, this series, and romance the thing, and romance. novels. We always go and, and we yeah. always end up just recommending romance yes. novels. Like it's like a... yeah. Fast and furious. Yeah, like 40, 45 minutes. So, everybody, if again, though, that's like a very specific time thing. So, if it's the day, check us out tonight. The first read of season six is Flowers from the Storm. You are all not ready. We are going high angst only in season six. Kid and sale. It's time. It is time. time we do it. I'm excited. And I'm excited. But the first episode of season six is not Flash from the Storm. It's a trailblazer. And it's a good it's one. also, it's a trailblazer and we're very excited. So, thank you all for listening through season five. Uh, we love having you. We love hearing from you. Um, we are here as long as you are here. And I can't believe people have been here for five seasons. I can't believe we have either. And you know what? It's like we have, we're not going to run out of things to talk about. Our list is epic. We have so many things on our list to do. So we'll see you on Patreon. We'll see you on Likewise. We'll see you in New Haven. And in the middle of September, we will see you back. Well, well, you'll hear us in your ear. We'll be dropping fun stuff over the next two weeks. So if you miss us, you can find us. you know in your ear holes continue to find us in your ear holes and thanks to everybody for supporting knockout uh that means a whole lot thanks jen and now the first two chapters of knockout narrated by mary jane wells chapter one the east end of london january 1840 lady imogen lovelace enjoyed explosions. To be clear, she was not a sadist. That an explosion might do bodily harm of some kind was not pleasing to her. No, if she was pressed, she would say that it was not exploded things that gave her joy, but rather the means by which one exploded things. Imogen liked bright flashes of light and waves of heat and the particular smell and the sound. 
To the untrained ear, a boom or a crackle or a hiss or a whoosh, but more often than not, some magical combination that made another word altogether. A ratatoon, a frizzle, a twill pop. A body would be hard pressed to find another in all of Britain who spent as much time thinking about the sounds of an explosion as Imogen did. Her first word had been bang, though no one had been paying close enough attention to hear it. As she was a lady, however, and an aristocratic one at that, few paid attention to Imogen's peculiar fascination, nor any of the many other peculiar fascinations she'd accumulated over her 24 years of life. In truth, most people ignored the fascinations altogether when discussing the only sister of Earl Doring, as peculiar was more than enough description to make a lady unappealing. Not that Imogen thought peculiar much of an insult. She'd been labelled as such since birth, since her father brought her in pinafores to the Royal Society of Chemistry, where she'd wandered off, combined quicklime and water, and nearly burned the place down before the Earl was informed in no uncertain terms that children, especially young ladies, are not allowed inside the building. Peculiar, they'd whispered as she toddled past, following her father into the street as he roundly praised her experimentation. Odd girl, too clever by half. If Doring's not careful, she'll turn out worse than too clever. She'll turn out to be too much. And she had done just that. Lady Imogen Lovelace was too much for society and too much for her brother, who became her guardian after her beloved father died when she was only 16 and far too much for any suitor who might have darkened the doorstep of her home in Mayfair. Though none had, as of that morning in January, one short month into her 24th year. Which suited Imogen down to the ground, as she'd much rather be too much than the alternative. And if the wide world felt too much was not enough for their balls and dinners and teas and company, then Imogen was happy to be left to her workshop in the cellars of Doring House, with her tinctures and tonics, and to her friends, who understood just how entertaining and enterprising she could be with her tinctures and tonics. No one ever discussed the sounds of explosions at tea. So it was that on that January morning, just after dawn, the air brisk and cold with a night that had not yet burned away, Imogen was at the site of an explosion. It was important to note that Imogen had nothing to do with the explosion in question. She did not know the sound it had made in a key moment, could only guess that it had been something of a thunder, considering that she was certain that the building had made a great noise when it collapsed to the ground. There was no particular explosive smell. Anything unique that might have lingered had been smothered by the acrid smoke of the fire the blasting oil had caused when it had been ignited, and the cloud of dust that had come from the building, now reduced to rubble. Twelve hours earlier, the building had housed O'Dwyer and Leafs, a seamstress shop tucked between a pub and a pie shop in Spitalfields on a bustling little strip of East London that should not have thrived but for the popularity of this particular shop and its skilful proprietresses, which attracted a constant stream of women. The loss of the establishment would be a loss to the businesses that had grown up around it. The building could not be salvaged. Relocation was the only option. A sad state of affairs indeed though not one that should rate the attention of anyone but those in the nearest vicinity. It most certainly should not rate the attention of an aristocratic lady, even less the attention of four of them. But this wasn't just any building, and these were not just any ladies. And so, in the heavy grey of the London morning, made heavier by the threat of icy rain and the particular silence of a building that had been razed to the ground, Imogen and three others stood amidst piles of rubble in the now hollowed-out space, open to the street and sky, between the hollow drum 
and Mrs. Twizzleton's savoury pie shop. The quartet was at once wildly out of place and entirely in control. They were the Hell's Bells, whispered about in ballrooms and barrooms throughout London. A team of women. Were there four? Forty. At times it seemed there were four thousand who had made a name for themselves by bringing down the worst of the corrupt world, when too often those in power refused to do the same. Few knew the identity of even a single member of the gang, let alone the identities of the four who founded the crew. After all, when it came to women, people rarely paid attention. And the Hell's Bells, who'd been delighted to be christened as such by London's gossip rags, quoting unnamed sources at Scotland Yard, were very happy to take advantage of that lack of attention and hide in plain sight. If one were looking, one might find the foursome together in Mayfair ballrooms and Kensington dining rooms and shops on Bond Street, where money and power and high fashion made for a certain kind of invisibility. They were just as commonplace in Covent Garden, where a good cloak and a better coachman could easily keep the identity of a woman hidden. But clad in brightly coloured silks and satins and freshly pressed cloaks, mucking about in the grey morning soot of the East End, that was a different thing altogether. Ladies did not go to the East End. Then again, it was not every day a business bankrolled by a wealthy duchess, two wealthy duchesses, and the daughters of two equally wealthy earls, was blown to bits. And so, well... Needs must. Needs, in this case, meant that Lady Imogen, lover of all things explosive, skilled explosive expert in her own right, was there to investigate. The smell, the sounds, the unique pattern of the blast. She crouched in the rubble, considering the fierce fingers of black soot across what had once been the space behind the ribbon counter, which was now blown to bits disintegrated beneath the strength of the blast. Looking up, Imogen considered the partially collapsed brick wall behind her, where the mirror that had once separated the front of the shop from its rear rooms had been blown out and destroyed by the heat. Above, the wooden floors had been incinerated, leaving only the shell of the staircase between the ground floor shop and the sky, now visible through the disintegrated second and third floors. She inhaled deeply, the air full of smoke and sulphur and cold rain. They certainly got the job done, didn't they? The words hung in silence for a moment, before she turned to look at two women who watched her with vague censure. She blinked. What? May I suggest you try sounding a touch less impressed about the destruction of an entire building, the Duchess of Treviscan offered. Imogen gave a little shrug. Whoever did it knew precisely where to place the device, and when to place it as well. Cecily Calhoun stood in the now disappeared doorway, looking out at the street beyond, where a handful of early risers were already on their way to their day. Late enough that anyone who saw anything saw nothing. Adelaide Carrington, newly minted Duchess of Claiborne, appeared from the rear of the building. The oldest rule of the South Bank. If you see something, say nothing. She brandished a stack of papers. Found them. Lockbox beneath the floor in the back room, just as Erin said. Excellent, Duchess said, unable to mask her relief, as Adelaide joined her by the staircase. In the wrong hands, the documents, carefully preserved by Francis O'Dwyer and Erin Leaf and recovered by Adelaide, would destroy lives. We don't need anyone to speak. Imogen will hear them anyway. Cecily chuckled. And the news will sing her praises. It was not always praise, but no matter the newsprint, respectable, the hell's bells, salacious, lady vigilantes, or revolutionary, defenders of the common woman, the ink sold papers thanks to an extensive following of people across Britain who enjoyed seeing truth finally shown to power, and a not insignificant following of those who held power and had no interest in hearing truth. It was the latter 
who set off bombs in places where women outside the seat of power congregated and shared ideas. Places like O'Dwyer and Leafs. There was no question that in the two years since the Bells had begun not only standing on behalf of those who were outside the power and privilege of Parliament, women, children, workers, poor, but also vanquishing those who wielded that power and privilege to punish, things had grown more incendiary. A queen on the throne had inflamed the aristocracy. The idea that women might chip away at generations of power in other places as well enough to turn that flame into something far more dangerous, something explosive. The result was more anger, an increase in rousing editorials about the weaker sex, more frequent cautionary tales about women gaining knowledge and strength, workers gaining rights, immigrants seeking equity, the poor demanding dignity, the dangers of sending children to school rather than work. One queen came the whispers, and they all expect to be treated like royalty. And now this. In three months, three explosions, at three such shops, each with a front and back room, a forward-facing business and a rear-facing one, one far more important than the other, and because of that, more dangerous. A bakery in Bethnal Green that acted as a waypoint for women escaping men who wielded cruelty and power-like weapons, a print shop in Whitechapel that made space for workers plotting for better treatment and wages, and now this, O'Dwyer and Leaf's seamstress shop, which hid one of London's secret women's health clinics. All reduced to rubble, in the hands of monsters with impressive science, rudimentary skill, and an absence of humanity. Watch those stairs, Imogen said without looking up from her inspection. They're not sound. Duchess snatched her hand back from the handrail that remained intact. I hesitate to ask, but is any of it sound? Imogen did not reply. She focused on her inspection. Adelaide adjusted her spectacles. Imogen, is any of it sound? Hmm? Imogen looked up. Oh, assuredly not. The three other women exchanged a look that was not uncommon when in proximity to their firebrand of a friend. Cecily, would you bring me my bag, please? Cecily looked askance at the carpet bag Imogen had left at the once door to the space. I prefer not to be flattened, honestly, Im. Don't worry about that. Imogen waved a hand toward the staircase. You'll be fine if you avoid the stairs. Duchess and Adelaide moved quickly to the opposite side of the shop as Cecily delivered the bag. Imogen opened the sack and rooted around within as Duchess looked to the street beyond, more awake than it had been thirty minutes earlier. Quickly, she said softly, the longer we linger, the more likely someone asks questions. Extracting a small vial, Imogen collected a bit of soot from the blast, along with a shard of glass that she hoped held traces of the blasting oil that had been used. Nearly there. It's not my father's work, is it? Adelaide asked from her safe distance. Imogen shook her head. Your father's boys lack the finesse. No offence. Adelaide laughed. (laughs) None taken. Finesse is not a quality that is required for running hired guns and heavy fists in Lambeth. That, and Alfie Trumbull, leader of the Bully Boys, the largest gang of criminals on the South Bank, had pledged to turn over a new leaf now that he had a duke for a son-in-law. It turned out that the hope of a grandson with a title made even the most hardened crime lord think about going straight. Or whatever straight meant for crime lords. Who then? Adelaide continued, adjusting her spectacles. Someone competent, Imogen said, using a ball bristle brush to sweep away the dust, intensely focused, carefully searching, but unimaginative. This is the same explosive device they used at the last one, and the one before that. Same blasting powder, same blast pattern. Unimaginative, or unconcerned with being caught? Duchess asked. Likely both, Imogen replied. Cecily popped a lemon sweet into her mouth, and wrapped her scarlet cloak tight around her. 
All right, so Imogen is close to the who, but why? It's always the same. Those in power don't like it when the rest of us are beyond their control, Duchess said with distaste, towing a pile of brick by her feet. But the same villain, at three different places, with three different purposes. I didn't say it was the same villain, Imogen said, standing up. I said it was the same person who set the bomb. You mean a hired gun, Adelaide replied. Duchess met her gaze. You're going to have to see your father, Adelaide. If it's not the bully boys blowing up the place, Adelaide nodded. Surely he'll have some idea of who is doing it. We need that name, and soon. She turned and looked to the street beyond, the sun up and the locals dressed and breakfasted, and coming to look. Duchess indicated the papers in Adelaide's arms and tilted her chin in the direction of the waiting carriage. You'd best get those inside before someone notices we found something that did not burn. The Duchess of Claiborne nodded and, slipping the hood of her cloak up over her flame-red hair, made her way out to the street and into the carriage. Cecily shivered. Come on then, Imogen. These things take time, Imogen said, not looking up from her work moving quickly and carefully, knowing time was short, and then, aha, got it. There, a bit of fabric. She lifted it from the dust carefully, extracting a second vial from her sack. The other women straightened, Duchess taking a step forward, peering over Imogen's shoulder as she carefully packed away her treasure. What makes that different than the yards of other fabrics charred to bits in this place? Maybe nothing. Imogen said, placing the vials inside her carpet bag before extracting the small notebook and pencil she carried inside the balloon sleeve of her bright blue coat. But I've seen this particular fabric before, at the bakery and the print shop, where fabric doesn't come by the yard. Opening the notebook, she ticked off several boxes, tinder, fuse, soot. Cecily let out a little sound of admiration. Well done, Im. Quite, Duchess said, but as you have removed somewhat critical evidence from the scene of the crime, I think we'd best be on our way, and quickly. Scotland Yard will be round soon enough. Imogen gave a little snort of derision. When are they able to make time for a seamstress shop in Spitalfields? She hefted her bag and made her way toward her friends, already turning to join Adelaide in the carriage. Not one man in the Metropolitan Police wants this assignment. I'm afraid you are mistaken, my lady. The deep, rich voice came from the rear of the building behind them. The trio stilled in the space between what had once been indoors and what had always been outdoors. Adelaide's face appeared in the window of the carriage, her eyes wide, fixed on a spot behind them, on a man behind them. Something happened in Imogen's chest. Ah. Uh, from a mark unique and familiar, not unlike that of the explosion that had summoned them there, that had summoned him there. She turned shoulder to shoulder with her friends and found his gaze dark and exasperated beneath his narrow-brimmed hat, as exasperated as the words he grumbled. Why are you here? Chapter 2 Detective Inspector Thomas Peck was having a bad day. It had begun at a quarter past five, decidedly the worst hour of the morning. Nothing good came of waking at a quarter past five. First, it was the coldest point of the night, too far from the fire in the hearth and not close enough to the sun breaking over the horizon. Second, it was early. Not so early that it seemed to be the dead of night, and not late enough to be considered a proper time for an early rise. It was early in the most irritating way, as if only the wide world could have held still another quarter of an hour, everything would have been perfectly in order. The inspector, you see, thrived when things were in order. The young constable from Scotland Yard's detective branch, who had knocked on the door of Mrs Edward's rooming house in Hoburn, had been unable to wait, however, and so a quarter past five, that ungodly hour, it was. 
It was not the fresh-faced boy's fault, Thomas would acknowledge later, once he'd found strong coffee and brisk air. It was Thomas's. Because he'd been more than clear with the entirety of the detective branch. If there was an explosion anywhere in London, at any hour, on any day, he was to be summoned immediately. But it did not mean he had to enjoy being roused before dawn. Nor did it mean his landlady had to enjoy it. Indeed, Mrs Edwards, who took great pains in berating the young constable loudly before shrieking, Detective Inspector! up the central staircase of the rooming house, claimed not to enjoy it, though she seemed to enjoy the shrieking well enough. Never mind that. By twenty to six, Thomas was returned to his stern, perfect control. Shaved, washed, dressed and exiting the house, Mrs Edwards at his back, shouting him out the door with her well-practised sermon, Why Decent Tenants Do Not Receive Callers Before Daybreak. It took a great deal more than a landlady's diatribe to deviate Thomas Peck from his course, however, and he closed the shining black door behind him, silencing the noise with a firm hand. He looked to the young constable. Where to? Where to was the East End, where a massive explosion had taken out a seamstress shop between a pie shop and a pub. Keenly aware of the police wagon in which he travelled, the detective inspector instructed the driver to drop him in the alley behind the building so he could enter unseen. The young constable did his best to hide his belief that the detective inspector was expecting more than was reasonable in Spitalfields. By all reports, the building had been raised in the dead of night. Surely any culprit would be gone. But Thomas Peck wasn't expecting a culprit. He was expecting something much worse. Chaos. The kind that came in a pretty plump petite package with bright eyes and glossy black curls. The kind that too often came with trouble. And mountains of paperwork. And there she was, as expected, Lady Imogen Lovelace, dressed in the bright blue of a summer sky. Had the woman ever worn a colour that wasn't in the damn rainbow? Holding the enormous carpet bag she was never without, between piles of rubble in an exploded building that was by no means stable, alongside two other ladies, the Duchess of Treviscan and Mrs Cecily Calhoun, promising to make his bad day much worse, as she always did. Thomas stopped them as they headed to their carriage, the newly married Duchess of Claiborne visible in the window of the conveyance. He would be lying if he were to say he did not enjoy the shock on the Duchess's face, and the way three sets of skirts swished around the ankles of the trio he'd frozen in their tracks. Lady Imogen turned first, of course. She began in the same manner she always did, by offering him a bold, bright smile, one clearly intended to addle the mind of a lesser man. But Thomas Peck was not a lesser man, and he was immune to the woman's charms. At least he was when he was prepared for them. Why, Detective Inspector, what a surprise to find you here. I wish I could say the same, Lady Imogen, he said, stopping next to a pile of fallen bricks that had once been a wall between the front and back rooms of the shop, resisting the urge to approach her. But I have come to expect you wherever there is mayhem. Her dark eyes went somehow brighter than they'd been, fairly twinkling. What a lovely thing to see. Her companion shared an amused look over her black curls. Careful, he said. I'm not convinced you don't cause it. She flashed him a smile that he might have thought was pretty if he weren't already braced for the full blast of it. Careful yourself. I'm not convinced you don't come searching for it. Mrs Cecily Calhoun snickered at the retort and Thomas scowled. He didn't come searching for it. He was an inspector of the detective branch of Scotland Yard. He had work to do and was too damn busy to follow this woman around no matter how often they crossed paths. I don't. Lady Imogen shook her head and Thomas had the distinct sense he was being patronised. Of course you don't. I come to places where crimes have been committed, places where I am required to do my job. 
the job you do well, she said, her gaze sliding over him in a way that he should not have liked so much. Hang on, was she mocking him? He narrowed his gaze. I do it very well, as a matter of fact. That smile again, full of delight and secrets. That's why I said it. More snickers from the ladies who flanked her. And he'd had enough. Ladies, why are you here? Do we require a reason? To be lingering in a hollowed out building, generally, yes. And what if my reason was simply that I enjoy explosions? That's a ridiculous reason, he replied. Well, that's rather unkind. I do enjoy explosions. <laughs> Enough to have caused this one. A pause and she smiled again, admiration in her gaze. Not that he was interested in the woman admiring him. Still, he did not dislike it when she said, Oh, that was very well done. His brows rose. What was well done? That quick response. An interrogation, wasn't it? So quick and casual that I might have answered it if I were a lesser woman. I imagine it works a great deal of the time. It did, as a matter of fact. And yet you didn't answer, she grinned. I did not. He shouldn't like it, the way she sparred with him, the way everything went brighter with the battle of wits she offered. He shouldn't like the way her curls bounced about her face. He shouldn't notice how her cheeks flushed with her own pleasure. And he most certainly should not wonder what other things made her cheeks flush with pleasure. He cleared his throat and regained control of the conversation. You are a woman with a confessed fondness for explosions in the early morning hours in the rubble of a building that has been razed to the ground. Am I on your list of suspects, Detective Inspector? No, he allowed, but you cannot fault me for finding you suspect. Take heart, Tommy. Most of London finds me suspect. He absolutely should not like it when she called him Tommy. He pressed his lips together, trying for his most intimidating look, one that regularly had hardened criminals rolling over. This is the third exploded location at which I've found you in as many months. The lady was unmoved. And what a tale it will make for our future children. It was only due to years of training that Thomas's face did not reveal his shock. He exhaled sharply and quelled the extraneous thoughts her teasing might have inspired in the mind of a lesser man. Lady Imogen, I believe you know more than you are willing to share about this particular crime. It's plausible. Lady Imogen tilted her head in his direction. Do you have a very serious plan for my interrogation? She was infuriating. So why was he considering all the ways he might interrogate her? Ways that began with tossing her over his shoulder and depositing her in the back of a dark carriage. His thoughts were interrupted by a bark of feminine laughter as the Duchess of Treviscan moved to leave the building. Truly, the two of you make an excellent play. If your current careers go south, you could always take to the theatre. With a delighted pronouncement, she made for the street. Mrs. Calhoun at her heels, leaving Thomas alone with Lady Imogen. He stepped closer to her, even though he shouldn't. I could arrest you, you know. On what grounds? she asked, matching his step with one of her own, tampering with the scene of a crime. Has there been a crime? She took another step, closer. Close enough for him to stare down at the top of her head, the roundness of her pink cheeks the point of her pert chin and beyond to where the bodice of her bright blue dress peaked from beneath a matching cloak. A gleaming brooch made of black obsidian set in a silver frame was pinned to the velvet at her breast, soft and lush, as lush as she was. He cleared his throat and dragged his eyes to hers, deep and brown. I expect so. She nodded her curls bouncing to and fro. As do I. He tightened at the words, at the way she said them with such simple clarity, as though she was his equal. And? And... She lingered on the word, and he hung on her hesitation, on the curve of her lips, 
the white edge of her teeth, the little hint of her pink tongue at the end of the word. I have done nothing requiring a trip to Whitehall. A pause before she added, not today, at least. Exasperation flared. What do you know? Nothing the police will help. You mean nothing that will help the police? Do I? With a smile, she turned away, and for one mad moment, he reached for her, stopping himself as his fingers barely grazed the cerulean wool of her cloak. She was a lady, sister to an earl. He couldn't touch her. What had he been thinking? The woman should not be let out of the house, truly. She was chaos and temptation. Not for him. He was perfectly in control, perfectly able to resist her. He'd resisted worse. Liar. He snatched his hand back and found his voice, ignoring the feel of her name on his tongue. Lady Imogen. She did not reply. Instead, coming to a stop, her heavy winter skirt swirling around her ankles with the change in momentum. He stopped too, his gaze tracking over her shoulder, past her curls, to the young white woman standing in Imogen's path, eyes wide in her pale face. Good morning. Lady Imogen said happily, as though they were anywhere but here, in the shell of a burned-out building. The young woman blinked, surprise and confusion, and something heavier on her face, something made worse when she looked to Thomas. Instinctively, he took a step backward, giving her space. Oh, she said softly, backing into the street, her gaze tracking over the building, the rubble. And finally, the lady, out of place. Oh, the young woman repeated, seeming to realise herself, and bobbed a quick curtsy. There's no need for that, Lady Imogen said, waving her up and tilting her head. May I help you in some way? I haven't. The woman, girl, really, she couldn't have been older than 16 or 17, hesitated looking to the building once more, eyes somehow going wider, like saucers, filling with palpable disappointment. Appointment, she swallowed heavy, desolate. This morning, with the seamstress, this morning. The last came with panic. Lady Imogen nodded. I understand. As you can see, she is not here. Is she? Another hesitation. Oh, she's quite well. Don't you worry about that. Already setting up shop not far from here. Imogen set down her carpet bag and pushed her cloak aside to reach deep into the wide balloon of her coat sleeve, extracting a small book and a pencil. Thomas wondered what else she might keep in that sleeve. He would not be surprised to discover a vial of poison or a sharp blade or a heavy candlestick ready for swinging within. While he wondered, Imogen scribbled on a page of the book before ripping it out and passing it to the girl, who stared down at it for a moment, before looking up once more, frustration keen in her eyes. She couldn't read. Of course, Thomas wasn't the only one to notice. Lady Imogen put a warm hand on the girl's arm and leaned in, whispering too softly for him to hear, though he tried, damn it. The girl's pale fingers, no gloves! grasped Imogen's, also no gloves, tightly. Thank you, Mom. Of course. The seamstress will have you sorted in no time. There's no need to worry. The girl dropped a quick bob and spun away, hurrying back into the grey morning, where the rain hovered on the brink of sleet. You know where Mrs O'Dwyer and Mrs Leaf are, Thomas said. Of course I do, Imogen replied, leaning down to collect her ever-present carpet bag. You do not? He clenched his jaw. You know, detective, she said happily, you really shouldn't begin your day without breakfast. An empty stomach puts you on the back foot. I am in no way on my back foot, my lady. A little smile appeared on her pretty pink lips. No, not pretty, not pink, just lips, ordinary lips, not at all for noticing. Forgive me. I would have thought you would have started with the location of Mrs. O'Dwyer in Leaf. He scowled. She wasn't wrong, but he'd be damned if he admitted it. Where are they? That would take the fun out of it, don't you think? And then, 
the absolute madwoman headed for her carriage, no doubt thinking she'd won the battle. He turned away, determined to restore quiet reason to the morning, looking immediately to a clear spot amid the rubble, a spray of dark soot marking the location where the blast originated, and circling the perimeter, a set of fresh, small footprints. His gaze traced the area, registered a disturbance in the blast pattern, new marks in the dust. He turned as the carriage door opened from within, welcoming Lady Imogen to safety, her black ringlets bobbing, her lovely bottom swaying as she reached to pass her bag up into the carriage. Not that the loveliness of her bottom had anything to do with him stopping her. Lady Imogen, he called out. She turned back. Your bag. She tilted her head. My bag? I don't suppose you'll show me what's inside? He would have wagered a year's salary that she had found something useful in the rubble and it was now tucked inside that enormous carpet bag she went nowhere without. Since he'd met her 14 months earlier, he wasn't counting, precision was his job, Lady Imogen Loveless had produced any number of remarkable things from that bag. Explosives, weapons, and a series of files that had helped Thomas put the newly formed detective branch of Scotland Yard on the map. Information on an earl who'd killed his wives. More on one who'd kidnapped children to let them die in his workhouses. Files thick as Thomas's thumb, each one stamped with an indigo bell and filled with enough evidence to send both of the men away for a lifetime. What is in there today, Imogen? And more importantly, why wasn't she willing to share it? She looked down at the bag in her hand, as though she'd just discovered that it was there. When she returned her gaze to him, there was a playful twinkle in her eye. Really, Mr Peck, you ought to know better than to ask a lady about the contents of her reticule. He slid a look at the bag, capacious, and nothing close to a reticule, and replied dryly, An odd thing to call a reticule. A bit more inside than a handkerchief and an extra hairpin, I'm guessing. I carry it with me on outings, and it is full of items that are of a personal nature, she said. If that is not a reticule, I don't know what to call it. Well, I don't think you'll be out of line calling it luggage, considering, he said. Nevertheless, she retorted, a lady never tells. She turned and passed the bag up through the open door, following it into the dark interior of the carriage. He watched, but not because of her lovely bottom. Instead, he watched to ensure that she left. Her presence was a continuous distraction. He had work to do, and he knew where to find her. Mayfair, where ladies lived, with aristocrats and money. Ladies who had no place in the East End. Though turning away required more effort than he would ever admit, Thomas did just that returning to the wreckage of the building to investigate the source of the blast, which had already been investigated by Imogen Loveless, who kept more secrets than a criminal mastermind. Walking the perimeter of the formerly front room of O'Dwyer and Leaf's dressmaker's shop, he moved toward the staircase, all that remained of the building itself, looking for any evidence left by the architect of the blast. His discerning gaze tracked the floor, searching for clues that might be revealed among the ash and soot and rubble. More footprints, heeled boots, blue no doubt, like her dress. Ladies like Imogen Lovelace wore shoes that matched their dresses because they were not beholden to practicalities. They could swan about in bright colours and never worry about soot on their hems or dirt on their heels as they had all the money and access and privilege they required to buy new skirts or boots or carpet bags or whatever else they required, whenever they required it. Ladies like Imogen Loveless could turn up in Spitalfields to play at investigating an explosion on a whim, because they had no reason to ever be here for legitimate work or life. Spoiled, he grumbled, deliberately sidestepping the footprints in the dirt, as though in doing so he might sidestep the woman herself. A creak sounded above and Thomas looked up, icy rain coming down through the charred rafters above. He narrowed his gaze and considered the missing upper levels. Somewhere, 
Surely there was something that had survived the explosion, some clue to what had happened here, so similar to what had happened to two other buildings in the past three months. He moved closer to the staircase, wondering how sturdy it might be. No, don't! He turned at the shout. Too loud to have come from a lady, and yet, Lady Imogen was there, leaping from the carriage into the street below, without waiting for the coachman to deliver a step into the mud, not caring that she was ruining her skirts. Proving his point. Except she didn't seem to be uncaring in that moment. There was something in her eyes, something like, concern? He shifted his movement, reversing his course, heading toward her. Another creak sounded from above, this one louder, more like a rumble. Imogen! The Duchess of Treviscan was leaping down from the carriage, reaching for her friend. Wait! Another rumble, louder, closer. He looked up at the stairs. Tommy, don't get too close to the... Christ, they were coming down. And Imogen Lovelace was running toward him. He moved without thinking, heading directly for her, lifting her clear off her feet, barely registering her little eep as he made for the street where her trio of friends stood shoulder to shoulder, eyes wide, as the staircase collapsed with a thunder, sending up a cloud of soot and ash behind them. He turned once he was outside the footprint of the building, looking back at the place where not ten seconds earlier he'd been standing, where she'd been heading. The stairs had collapsed into a heap of wood and brick, enough to have killed a man and a woman. An emotion he did not care for flared, and he looked to the lady in his arms, unable to stop himself from asking, loud and irritated, Do you see now? That you have no place inside exploded buildings. That you might be hurt. Imogen's eyes were wide, and for a heartbeat he saw something there, something like fear. And he loathed it, the way it muted her. Her fire returned, hotter than before. I wouldn't have been in there if you had taken more care. He barely contained a roar of frustration. He should put her down, put her down, and leave her there, on the street in Spitalfields, the madwoman. And he would. In just a moment. Just as soon as he was certain she was out of trouble. Oh my, Cecily Calhoun interjected from afar. Would you look at the muscles on him? I wonder if I could convince Henry to grow a beard again, the Duchess of Claiborne said. It is so exciting when they let you shave them off. Thomas looked to the women watching them. Aren't you married, ladies? Ah, but not dead, Mrs Calhoun replied, as the Duchess of Claiborne nodded happily. We're simply admiring the fine way you saved our friend. Their friend, still in his arms, the soft, lush weight of her a perfect reminder that she was safe, that they were alive, that his heart thrummed in his chest. Not that I needed saving, Imogen said softly, or rather, not that I would have needed saving if you hadn't ventured so close to the stairs. He could not stop the growl that came from deep in his chest at the words. Her brows rose. Of course, that you did get so close to the stairs, and I did come back inside. Thank goodness you were there to save me, Tommy. He ignored the way the diminutive one only his mother and sister used sounded in her soft, aristocratic voice and corrected her. Detective Inspector. Christ, she was so soft, and she smelled so sweet, like tarts in a shop window, like pears and cream. And as he held her and told himself to set her down, damn it, the feel and scent of her took control of the situation, making it impossible to do anything but feel her, smell her, look at her, all pink cheeks and dark, sparkling eyes, and a smile he should not commit to memory. When she put a hand to his chest, he couldn't help his flinch. For a single wild moment, Thomas Peck was out of control, and he did not like it. That's a lovely sound, she said. A harumble. She was talking about him, about the sound he'd made. He put her down immediately. <laughs>